The Washington Huskies taking on the Texas Longhorns. I'm honestly, man, we had two unbelievable. Are they the best two games? Hands down. Hands down. Like, when you think of the playoff, the 14 playoff got, what, a decade? Yeah. Hands down, those the might be the best two yeah. games, it's, and we got them both in the same. It's same the same day. as the Pac-12. Yeah, right. Just it, absolutely phenomenal, phenomenal games in the college football playoffs. The last year of the four team, you get these two great games. The last year of the Pac-12, you have the best football year in the conference in a decade. We'll we'll talk about how stupid uh, Florida State was for acting the way they did uh, after the score that they put up. My goodness, goodness. Gracious. Uh, but the game we do have to talk about is Texas Washington. Will, when you and I were in here last week and we were talking about this game, the big question you and I had was can Texas's defense, can their defensive front be impactful enough to d- disrupt and derail this Washington offense, which features a wide receiver core, which I think we can now safely say is the best in the country? Yes. Easily. Coming into the season, Ohio State won, you dub two. Everybody else was, was playing for, for third and beyond. Right now, you dub is significantly ahead of Ohio State. As good as Marvin Harrison Jr. was this season, Roma Dunze, Jalen Millian, and Jalen Polk or uh, uh Jalen Polk and uh Jalen McMillan. Yeah, yeah. yeah both Jalen's. Right. I paused for a second. I'm like, is that right? For a second, J- Jalen McMillan? There's yeah. so many McMillan's. There's so many you Jalen's. Re- you have to go through. Hey, and they all spell it different. Jalen Polk does not spell it the same. No, J A apostrophe Lynn, L Y N N, which I thought was always a little bit interesting. But you get Roma Dunze going for a buck 25, Jalen Polk going for a buck 22, and then two more wide receivers in Westover, who stepped up huge in this game, for 59 Big. yards, and McMillan for 58. And you have four wide receivers that just Puts you in hell. Abs- uh, Jeremy Bernard, oops, fumble. <laughs> oops. Uh, the Washington Huskies did not play a perfect game. Nope. They had their issues. They had their issues. They they came out, I think, a little bit slow. Defensively, I think they were bend but don't break. Quinn Ewers in the first half was not good. He struggled. His he, best plays were when he ran. Sec, well, in the second half, he was a dude. I think he had 110 yards in the first half, if I remember right. Finished, I think he had 215 or 218 in the second half. He was a much, much different quarterback in the second half. Finished 24-43, 318, and a touchdown. Uh, they they punched in their touchdowns all on the ground. Penix, though, 29 of 38, 430, two touchdowns. Uh, Dylan Johnson picking up two on the ground, which is a very interesting note. Uh, the the feeling of this game early on was, oh, Michael Penix is going to be good, and he has 255 yards and a touchdown in the first half. A lot of that comes because they just eat up yards. Just eat up yards, eat up yards, eat up yards, eat up yards, over and over and over and over again. And then they get into the red zone. Did you think it was a little bit strange, Will, that when they got in, when they got in scoring territory, they stopped throwing the ball? Yes and no. Um, a lot of what UW does great in their passing ability and their passing game is everything is either extremely short or they're taking it off. They're taking a chance, right? They're taking a deep threat. When you see a lot of the, the big plays that this Huskies team has had, it's been because they've had one or two guys go deep. And I, I truly do think UW is not known for their running ability, especially this year, right? Their rushing game. Was not very good, and that's no, due to a lot of injuries. But they also they capitalized when they needed to, particularly in the games against Oregon. Right, and and their running back had big games against USC and against Oregon. I believe that against Texas, even though they knew that Texas's D line was going to be able to stop that rushing attack, they felt like they had to do it just to keep them honest. And I think that in that red zone, what their fear was, Texas would be able to dial up more blitzes because everything is faster in the red zone. So we're going to run the football and try to attack those points where they are blitzing, right? Because if you, as, as a football team, if you beat the blitz, there's no one there on that side. It's a high risk, high reward move, right? Because if Texas beats you, they're getting a tackle for loss. You're not gaining any yardage, but If you are able to pick up a man for a man and your running back hits that hole through, you're running easy into the end zone. So I wonder to a degree with you, Dub's game plan is, hey, we can attack them this way. And maybe they might not, they might not be expecting it because we're not known for our running ability. 
we're going to try and take advantage where we can here. So I think that's where you, you saw that game plan from you, dub. If I was them though, I would have ran a lot more tunnel and bubble screens. You, they, they, they didn't because they stretched the field so often. Mm-hmm. And, uh, our, our boss, Jeff Austin, Mr. Texas himself, yeah. uh, decided he was going or decided he was, he was telling, uh, talking to us this morning and mentioned that Texas was playing soft on the outside all game long. Right. And that was something that they were doing and, and Washington was more than glad to take that, uh, through the first half, um, Washington is just gouging them. Big play after big play after big play after big play. Texas goes five and out. Five plays, 11 yards. They don't do anything. Washington comes down, and all of a sudden, it's aired out. I would love to know the script for this game. Because they come out. There's the uh, little check down. Offsides. Dylan Johnson, counter the outside. And then it comes. Hey, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna go short. We're gonna run a little counter, and then when they think they're like they're settling into the game, the, the the first play butterflies are gone. We're gonna let this thing go. No, Dunze, run, right, run, and Penix goes, boo, and just dots him for seventy-seven yards, and you went, uh oh, uh oh. It was also one of those things too where. And you've seen this from this UW team all year long. They went into seven man protection because they knew mm-hmm. that they have wide receivers. Didn't matter if you doubled or not. Cause Polk has doubled on that. That yeah. is relatively good coverage mm-hmm. there from Texas. Mm-hmm. And that's why when we were talking about this, Texas played off on them all game because what Texas wants to do, they want you to catch the four and five yard little out. Keep route. everything in front of you. Keep everything in front but of you. That's not what Washington because eventually you'll make the mistake. Yeah, but that's not how Washington operates. That's not how they, Washington operates. They chunk yards you to death. And Michael Penix can make throws that no one else can make. And he has three wide receivers that at any point can can take it to the house for yeah. six. And that play is the perfect encapsulation of that. You have a guy, you have a safety over the top for Texas. You have a corner that is almost running stride for stride mm-hmm. with Polk. Penix is able to put that ball perfect where Polk can not only catch the ball in stride, but he still has room instead of running completely out of bounds, mm-hmm. which you'll see a lot of quarterbacks that yep. make that throw. He's able to slow himself down and go back upfield. Mm-hmm. A lot of quarterbacks either throw that ball too far. So Polk has to make a crazy catch and goes out of bounds or they leave it short. And if he, that throw is two yards long or two yards short, that's it's a the interception or it's, or it's out of bounds. Yeah. Right. It's a perfect throw and it's a perfect play by Polk. And honestly, as as far as that game went from Penix, it might have been his third or fourth best throw. He had and it was perfect. He had probably six throws that made you yell at the screen. You just yell at the screen because you go, "Holy crap!" You you you. There 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 were times during that game where I yelped. Yeah. Just because of how incredible the throw was over and over and over again. And there was nothing Texas could do. And we talk about we talk about Oregon being a finalist for the Joe Moore Award uh, for the best offensive line in the country. And when Washington won it, I was a little bit surprised. But then you look I was as well. The, but then you look, this Texas front, one of the best pass rushing fronts in the country, their interior pass rush is nasty. Right. They've got linebackers to get after it. They've got a solid secondary athletically. I don't think anybody can match up with Washington at all. But Penix has kept clean. Penix has kept clean the entire game, and they only have three total tackles for loss and actually only two negative plays on the game. Right. But here's here's what I'm going to tell you, and I think this is the unsung... This is this is the X factor, and this is why you won. What has been the knock against Penix with NFL teams and why they don't want to take him? Because he's been injured, and he's been mm-hmm. beat up, and he's had two ACL surgeries. When Penix was at Indiana, Penix could run, and he did run, and he wanted to run. Everyone remembers from the COVID year where he's the Indiana quarterback who is diving for the two-point conversion where literally the very tip of the ball hits the pylon before he goes out of bounds. But because of the injuries at UW, you haven't seen him run. And this UW offensive line, they have been fantastic all year. I believe the number is Penix got sacked 11 times this season. Mm-hmm. Pretty impressive playing Utah less, and Oregon. Less than twice. one a game. 
in this game, Texas won a couple times where they got guys into the backfield, mm-hmm. but Penix actually ran and he ran mm-hmm. for what? 20 or 30 yards, 31 yards, three carries, 31 yards. He hasn't ran for 30 yards all season long. No, he's kept, he's kept he, it in the pocket. He does a great job yeah. of being able to maneuver in the pocket to keep himself upright. But this is the first game where he actually ran and it w- came in big moments. And it's why they won this football game. He was able at different times in this game to use his body to go and get the first down. Now, none of these were for touchdowns, but it seemed like whenever he did it, it was in a big key moment and it got UW a first down where they were able to run more clock. And some of them resulted in touchdowns. Most of these runs resulted in field goals, but being able to run that extra two to three minutes off the clock and being able to get that extra first down to make it an easier field goal for your kicker is what ended up leading to the victory in this game. And I know we're going to talk about it later because I have some complaints, but I feel like this UW team won at times despite the coaching. As good as DeBoer has been, and he might, well, shoot, he is the best coach in college football right now. He literally won the award for it. He had some boneheaded calls in late moments in this game and in key moments of this game. And he should be thanking Michael Penix. Yeah. And really, he should be thanking his entire defensive secondary for bailing him out of that one. And that's exactly where we're going to go to next. Uh, the final minutes of this game, we have to talk about, uh, as well as some additional news and notes surrounding this game and just how dominant of a wide receiver play that we saw from UW this week. As good as Keelan Boer was in this game, and they were great. They seemed to have an answer every single time they needed something, except for in the final minute of the game. In a moment where they absolutely unequivocally should have kneeled out the ball, I don't care about another first down. You're going to give this ball back with about 14 seconds on the clock to a team that has not shown that they can go 80 yards in 14 seconds for a touchdown. You get your running back hurt. Which, he was in a boot following the game. He may not be able to go on, on next weekend for the national championship game. Right. Because you didn't kneel out. On the impending turnover after the punt, your cornerback absolutely eats it on his shoulder and looked like he was at his, uh, uh, Jabil Muhammad looked like he separated his shoulder. Thank God he came back into the game. All because your hubris was so overwhelming that instead of just taking a knee, you decided you were going to try to force this. And then you just make mistake after mistake after mistake. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defend DeBoer a little bit because I do have some issues with play calling. I've already talked about the fourth and one where they put Johnson back there as the quarterback and then they ran some kind of power scheme. The Wildcat where, where they got nothing. And I hate that play call. Oh, God. And the reason I hate that play call is because Dylan Johnson isn't going to throw the ball. The beauty of the quarterback run is you think that they might throw the ball. So you have to commit guys to the back end. You have to commit guys to try and guard the wide receivers. When Dylan Johnson is in there at running back, well at quarterback, but quarterback has a running back. He isn't throwing the ball. So they're going to load the box. It's a dumb play call. I don't have an issue with him running the ball on first, second, and third down there instead of taking a knee. Here's why. If they do get that first down, then the game is over. Hindsight is always 20-20, right? And if you look at it and you told Kalen DeBoer, hey, you're going to run the ball three times. On the third play, you're going to get your running back hurt. Texas is going to get the ball back with 50 seconds. Of course he takes it. But here's the thing. You receive the ball. With a minute and nine seconds. Right. Texas has one timeout. Mm, two. I'm oh, sorry, you're right. You're right. Two timeouts. They have two. They have two timeouts. Mm-hmm. So you run the first play, you get it down to 106, timeout. Right. You run the second play, runs down to 102. You run one more play, you are getting that clock down to a bare minimum 20 seconds. At bare minimum 20 seconds. Okay. Take the delay a game, punt. Or call a call timeout. Whatever you want to do, right. run it all the way down. Now you punt. You're going to get four seconds off the clock. You're now going to make a team go the full length of the field in 12 seconds. 
Yes, but if you get the first down, well, you don't have to give it back. Well, it's any. 12 seconds. But if you get the first down. length of the field. That was Touchdown. enough. That was enough for Patrick Mahomes. Crazier things have happened. If you get if the first down the running averages. the football there, if you get the first down running the football there, you never have to give it back. This is fine if you're Oregon. You're a team who is built on the run. This right. is fine if you're Liberty. <laughs> you're built on the run. You are the University of Washington, and you have not run the ball. You are not a run the ball team. Right. Neil. The ball, if you're going to be aggressive, put the ball in the hands of Michael Penix. If you're going to sit there and not stop the clock, put the ball in the hands of the guy that makes plays. Well, if Dylan Johnson doesn't get hurt, you still run everything down. It's a, that, that injury, it's a fluky injury. It, it, no, no, it is. But you got the injury because you tried to have it both ways. You tried to be who you aren't, and you, your aggressiveness wasn't tied to who you are. I don't feel like that's being aggressive by running the football there, though. That is just, that is how you play the game. That is how coaches have played football for years. And I would I, say, I that, love that play call. I don't. I do, I do not at all. If you're, if you're gun, like, if you're going to take the chance, take the chance. Put the ball in the hands of your best players. But if he throws an incomplete pass, then you're killing them for the same thing. Yes. But it's a fluke injury. But if, if, I'm, I don't, I don't care about the injury. Right. You, the injury came about because of what you did. I, that's circumstantial. Right. You put yourself in that position because you failed to be who you are. Do you understand what I'm saying? You are not a team that lines the ball up and runs the ball. You would rather have them take the knee or put the ball in Michael Pettis' yes, hand. Those are your two choices, and try in my and, opinion. Yes. So then, so then by your logic, you know what? You could call there, and I'll go with you, you on you this one. You went down the middle path. You tried to have it both ways. Well, and, and I'll go with you on this one, right? With your abilities and with your inability to run the ball on the ground, why not go with a bubble screen there? It's yes. almost a 100% completion shot there. And put it in the position of one of your Odun, playmakers. Put it into Odunze's hands. Yeah. Put it in Polk's hands. Put it in McMillan's hands. Put right. it in one of your dude's hands that can go make a play in space. Okay. Quit trying to run between the tackles. And, and that's something that I can get behind there. Because in my eyes, I don't think you can take a knee there. Because basically what you're saying by taking a knee there is we're okay with giving them back the ball and we're okay with what happens after it. There have been plenty of crazy things that have happened that have lost you that game. And if you if you take that knee and Texas scores, it is the worst coaching decision since Pete Carroll throwing the ball on the one-yard <laughs> line with Marshawn Lynch. Even though when you go back and you look at that play, New England outnumbered. Seattle in the box. Mm -hmm. The smart play was to throw the ball because that's where you had the advantage, but they made a better play than you. So if, but again, you, you, you made a call based on who you're not. And I think that's what fair. people didn't want. It's not that Pete Carroll threw the ball. It's that they didn't give beast mode the chance. Right. And, and that's what I guess. And if that's, that's your move here with you, dub, I can get behind that, but to go out, if they would have went out and let's say they threw a slant mm -hmm. or they had, you know, a middle pass there. Cause it was what third and six. Yeah. It gets knocked down or gets picked off. It, or whatever. It, right. The sure. worst thing that happens, you're getting lambasted. Yeah. And if Dylan Johnson doesn't get hurt, we don't say boo about what happened. No one. No. And, and think that, about that rule needs knee. to go away. Right. Because what should, what, what should happen there is there should be an option because there's, there's a, there's got to be something there where an offensive player, if he's legitimately hurt, why should it stop the clock? Because if you're, think about this: if you're if you're Washington and you don't have timeouts, mm -hmm. and you get to that spot and all of a sudden, oh, injury, on a, then you get the runoff. But right. if you don't, you don't you don't get the runoff, and it's like, I didn't I didn't want to stop there. Why is the clock right. like? Let us get up and like. Running clock, let's go. We well, get back on the ball. The other thing that I think is weird is like, even if there is a stopped clock, why wouldn't it reset and run? That's what I'm saying. With like twenty five seconds, get back up on on the ball when the when you get when everybody's back, once the injury's off, umpire right. over the ball. It Everybody run. good? Run right. Like how is that? I, 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 it's just, a weird rule, and I I don't think that I knew that that was the rule. I just it's dumb. Happened. It's dumb. Also, speaking of dumb, what? A just brain neutral play to get the kick catch interference. What the hell are you doing? 
That's someone who's letting the moment be too big for them. Oh, we saw it. so you I mean, have we saw it in both games though. Dumb special teams oh, decisions. Oh, this special teams cost Michigan and you dub. <laughs> the special teams play was with, like uh, both both college football playoff games as great as they were. They were great because the special teams was so bad. It was horrible. I mean, just and you're holy crap. You're the long snapper. You're only able to get down there so fast because you know they want to fair catch it. it it's absolutely ridiculous. And then, you know, I. I don't know if that was the greatest catch I've ever seen by the Texas running back. Cause I really don't think it was a catch. I when li- live time and then on the replay, I was like, ah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't I don't think it's a catch. But it was already called one on the field. So yeah, how it's can like you take it over to, Yeah. It, it's like in the Oregon game on the Stevens interception. Yes. Like, the ball ah, hit the well. ground, but it was already called a catch, so yeah, it's probably going to stay a catch. Yeah. It's underneath half of it, but yeah. it's not underneath the half that hit the ground. <laughs> like, how does that work? And then, look, I mean, then yours uncorks it, and you have unbelievable yeah. catch. And yeah. so you have got the Dylan Johnson injury. Then you've got the kick catch interference, and then you've got a forty-one yard pass. And then, but all of this happens because there's time on the clock. Right. They get the ball with 41 seconds. Yeah, and in college football, every first down in the final two minutes, the clock stopping. The clock stops, and it and again, it turns into an eternity. And that's the thing is, if you if you do punt the ball, 12 seconds, they've got to go 80 plus yards in 12 seconds with no timeouts. Yes, but if the, he doesn't the, get hurt, but I'm just same thing. I'm saying, just in general, right? The math tells you that is significantly unlikely. It is Sign- significantly. significantly unlikely. You are correct. It is significantly unlikely. But if you get burned, that's football gods, man. That's not what your fan base is going to say. It's football that's gods, not man. what the AD is going to say when you go into a co- contract negotiation. Just saying. And if Dylan Johnson doesn't get hurt, also significantly unlikely. They get they get it back with twelve anyways. You should have been playing with free money there because if Dylan Johnson doesn't get hurt. You're getting it back with 12. If Dylan Johnson gets through, your offensive line gets their job done, they might even get a first down. I can listen to your argument where Mm -hmm. you say, hey, put the ball in your best player's hands. Put it in Penix's hands and do a high percentage play, right? Maybe it's a little shovel pass to Odunze. Up, up front, some bubble screen, some, a tunnel just screen. Give me something, something where, hey, where the ball's high, not dropping. It's a high percentage play. The clock's going to keep running. But you I, have an opportunity because running right. between the tackles in that game, you Dylan Johnson staying healthy, he's not getting that first down. Right. And, and you know what? I can get behind that logic. And totally. That, that's that's but the I'm, thing that I can't yeah. get behind the taking the knee. That's what I'm saying. If it's for me, it's it's one or the other. You're either hyper aggressive and you're putting the ball in the hands of your best players, or you're taking the knee. I don't like the in-between. And and that's something I can get behind. That and I, I know, get behind, I know. Well, what happens if hand. if the if that sure-handed wide receiver core drops the ball? Blah blah blah. And like again, this is a, a note from the game. Washington wide receivers were targeted twenty times for nineteen catches and three hundred and fifty-three yards. That's as dominant a wide receiver game that has ever existed. That was the three, right? Yes. That was Polk, McMillan, and Odunze. Yes. Three hundred fifty-three yards, nineteen of twenty. It doesn't. It doesn't. Patrick Mahomes get, is sitting here throwing his hands in the sky, saying, "Why can't I have that?" It doesn't get more dominant than no. that. No, you had and to have a big and game. That is why player. I would. I would put the ball in their hands. The games they were having, the hands that team has, the special ability to make a play. And I know that goes counterintuitive to run the ball, run the clock, everything that I'm talking about, as opposed to taking the knee. But I'm saying that if you're going to be aggressive, be aggressive and true to who you are. And if it's a high percentage throw, bubble screen, tunnel screen, shovel pass, I can get behind you on that. So, uh, but Texas does get an opportunity. They get the 41 yard throw. I feel like when you got there, yours didn't, neither the wide receivers nor the place that they called gave yours a chance. They did the thing Alabama didn't do, which was they took the shot. They, had to. they took the, they took the shot at the end zone. Right. But I, when I watched it, I was like, I would have liked to see. Like, I know you have to go to the sidelines. I know where the clock, time, and and, and downs, and and how much games left. All those things. 
I wish they would have taken one in the middle of the field in the end zone where you, where you, you've, you've got a big bodied receiver who has an opportunity to go make a play. If you're going to do that, you better make sure you get in. I know. Now and I'm talking about, a, we're talking about a route going into the end zone in my right, opinion. Right. That that's just so you had a little bit more space to work with because throughout the day, yours was really good in the second half. I don't think he was as good as he had he has been in previous games. Well, I I think, and this is true of Milro too. This is why both of these guys need another year of college football. Yeah. Quinn Ewers, if he wanted to come out this year, might be a day two guy, uh, like mid mid to early. It depends. I think he's more day three. Well, I, but I think he's QB seven or eight on the board. But he's young. It's fair. And he's got a strong arm. He can make all the throws mm-hmm. and he can move. And a lot of NFL scouts love quarterbacks that mm-hmm. can do that. And He's extremely, extremely young. Yep. But the thing about most young QBs, and you saw it with Milro, and you saw it with Ewers, and I do think Ewers is a better QB prospect. Oh, for sure. They're going to have their ups and downs. And Ewers had his ups and downs in this game. He had moments where you saw flashes of greatness. He also had moments where it was like, what are you freaking doing? And so I think at the end of the day, that's why you dub. You know, UW was able to win this game because they were able to take advantage of those, and they didn't have, aside from the fumble, and obviously the turnover for Texas wasn't Ewers' fault, but they didn't have that mistake. Michael Penix didn't make that mistake. None of their skill players on offense made that mistake. Ewers had moments where he had guys that were open, mm-hmm. and he couldn't put the ball on yeah. them. And it, and it was the same thing on the final play. I feel like where he put that ball on the final play of the game was not the best spot to put that ball. If he could have put that ball three yards further up where he throws it high and lets his wide receiver go and get it, Texas's receivers showed all game they could go up and get the ball with Yeah, they they high-pointed quite a few. Why would you throw it back to where the corner is? Why would you throw it back where not only is he going to have to jump up high but find a way to tap his toes? That ball's got to be put in a better spot. Hmm. Thank you for text line. As a Texas fan, that was a fitting ending. This team was a house of horrors all season. <laughs> also, running between the tackles, the Joe Moore award-winning O line when it would have been when it won, would have won a won the game with a first down or B ran the clock down 10 50 seconds. That's um that's the right call 10 times out of 10. I don't disagree with the logic what you're pointing out behind that, but your the Joe Moore award award winning offensive line wasn't road grading and allowing this Washington team to pound the rock all season long. If this was a Utah Joe Moore award winning offensive line, one that's meant to just absolutely pummel you a Georgia or an Alabama one that has been made to road grade you out of the way and get six, seven yards at a time. Sure. But this Washington team wasn't set up 